It's all the way lie. It's all the way lie. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> oh, <I'm> man. <laughs> I'm back. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Jam and Lewis. Just listen with Jam and Lewis. We are here for another week. Uh, last week, we were down for a week, but we're back up again. And uh, we hope you have uh, some questions for us. We'll try to get to answer some questions. But we have a very special guest with us today. Highly esteemed. And he is highly esteemed. I agree with that. Um, also, people may not know this, but he's your brother, Terry. That's right. Not, not your soul My brother, brother from my mother. That's right. <laughs> you may recognize him from many, many exploits from Purple Rain to Under the Cherry Moon. You may recognize him from the fishnet video, the 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 jerk out video, the you name it. He is the finest mirror man ever. The in the mirror man hall of fame. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're talking about Jerome Benton. Oh, what up, fellas? <laughs> yeah, man. Doing? Hey, man, it's all good, man. It's great to see you, Rome. Oh, man, it's good to be here, as they would say on TV. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> I always say it's good to be seen. I'm trying uh, to get in the picture here. How do I do that? Okay. How's my brothers doing? We're good, man. We're good. Terry, you know Terry likes to say upright and breathing better than the other way. Right on the right side of the dirt. Yeah, <laughs> way to be right now, man. Yeah, man. So, Rome, how are you doing, my brother? I'm I'm doing good. Um, I was um busy with the family and uh, uh, about a week ago, and I turned on Sirius Radio. Uh oh. And I heard Jim and Lewis. If I was driving twenty eight hundred miles, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean, you guys' music commandeered and and took over the the serious radio programming for hours, for hours, and I'm sitting and listening to it and and talking to my baby, and I'd be like, wow, five hundred. Six, seven hundred songs playing <laughs> hours, hours of, of Jam and Lewis, different variety of music, Human League, Janet, Boys to Men, Mint Condition, Alexander O'Neill, uh, uh, Rod Stewart, all that stuff, all that stuff. Uh, uh, Cuckoo Girls, what's her name? Gwen <laughs> You know? Only only one video. Cuckoo girls. Oh yeah. my god, that's but funny. I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I, I, like, whoa, my brothers are bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, just having fun, Rome. That's all that is, man. Yeah, and I, you know, and 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 just being part of the family, I I'm just so proud of y'all. <laughs> hey man, well we hey. appreciate it, man. We're we're just we're we're just real fortunate and. I was talking to somebody earlier today and, and Terry and I talk about this all the time. Like we really enjoy the time that we come up, you know, that we literally, and our album is actually a good, um, you know, a good example of when we started, it was analog tape. It was a big 24 track tapes and, you know, on the machine and literally on our album is songs that are 24 track tape songs. And then there's songs that are literally just on the computer you know, on a laptop, you know, and to have been around long enough to kind of experience all of those things and have all of those tools in the shed, so to speak, is is pretty amazing. But also the eras of music that we've grown up with, where we've had a chance to grow up listening and meeting when Terry and I met, we met over Earth, Wind and Fire. And then later on in our careers got to work with Earth, Wind and Fire. You know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty special, man. It's pretty and special. And to add to that, nothing sounds the same. Nothing. No, everybody got their own sound. No, everybody's got their own sound. That was we, we purposely did that at the beginning, which was kind of, I guess it was tough. We didn't think of it like that, but it was just like we want everybody to sound like themselves, you know, like their best selves, whatever that is. Yeah, not you know? like Neil Sedaka. 
Yeah, don't sound like, don't sound like Neil Sedaka. Hey, that Dakar just fell. It's better than Oprah. It was, yeah, right. Yeah, that just, you guys, this catalog is just, woo. This, uh, whoever has that catalog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah. Looked, looked up on a few here and there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Sure. Hey, man, let's, let's go, let's start at the beginning, Rome. Uh -huh. Like, let's talk about just, you know, before our relationship, I mean, obviously you and Terry's relationship, mm -hmm. but then let's just go forward and, and, and tell those stories, man. Cause we, we go back a long ways, man. And back in the time days, people may not know we were, we were roommates Yeah. back in the time days, <laughs> but even pre that you were, before you were Jerome, the mere man, you were Jerome, the, the roadie at, at one point, um, you you have a, a storied uh, career. So right. we should go back and talk about all that. But let's talk about like your growing up days, um, you know, and how, you know, in Minneapolis and, and, and all of that and just what well, you remember from back in that time. Well, you know, me and Terry are brothers, like mm -hmm. Jam opened up with. Um, we're from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we have the same mother. Ain't no half shit going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, we uh, ended up moving to Minneapolis. I mean, we moved to St. Paul. Uh, my father worked for the packing house in South St. Paul. And my mother worked for Veterans Hospital. And uh, they both took jobs in Minnesota, which brought us to St. Paul. Um, we went to school over in St. Paul. We went to uh, Maxfield. And uh, what was the other school over there, Tari? was a junior high? Oh, man. You're, gonna, you're taking me back, Rome. Jefferson. <laughs> Jefferson. Yeah, was it Jefferson? No, 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 no. Saint, it was um up on Saint. Uh, what was that? Jeez. Man, you caught me off the road, Rome, because your memory is better than mine, man. <laughs> well, I remember, <laughs> but I remember we were in the moving truck and we pulled in after a long ride from that six, seven hour ride from Omaha to, to St. Paul. And mm -hmm. my father parked the truck and he got out. And Terry, <laughs> Terry said, uh, we call Terry Poochie. <laughs> Poochie. <laughs> we, was, we was watching Poochie. my father. We was watching my father in the mirror. And there was a, a row of houses, double bungalows. And there was this big raggedy, kind of kind of dilapidated. Well, it wasn't that raggedy, but to us it was. <laughs> It was a raggedy green house, and Terry said, I sure hope we don't move in that house. <laughs> well, guess what? That was, that the, was the one. That, that was how we moved in. And uh, we moved in there, and that's where uh, the Benton and the Lewis's family life began in the state of Minnesota. Um, we weren't there that long. We, um, we ended up moving to uh, Minneapolis. Uh oh, we lost it. I'm back. All right. And uh, we ended up moving to Minneapolis, North Minneapolis, uh, over by North Commons Park. I'm not going to give up an address. <laughs> uh, too much information tagged to an address. Um, we moved in there and uh, we began our, our uh, Minneapolis life. Uh, my father um, came from a, a somewhat musical family down in Arkansas. Um, I have a famous uncle, uh, his name was Buster Benton. He was with Stax Record and with Muddy Waters and Buddy Guy and all those guys. He played down there with them. He was and a bad boy father, too. Huh? He was a bad boy. Oh uh, yeah. He I listened to his stuff, man. His, his stuff was very contemporary even back then, man. Yeah, so that's why you can stick the chest out on, man. You, you built from good stock there, boy. <laughs> and his name was Buster Benton. Rome, what year was that? Was that, that six, 60s 60, or when, where, where was that? That was 67, 66, okay. Tari? Okay. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, when we moved to Minneapolis? Uh huh. Mm. Ah. Mm. Yeah, probably, yeah, late 60s. Late 60s. Yeah, it was, it was like, um, it was. It was either right before or right after the the riots. I mean, right. 
So it was 66 then. 66. The 66 so, yeah, because I just remember I, we moved in and the whole whole thing went crazy. And then our whole neighborhood was like burnt up. There's only one only one building on Plymouth. And, <laughs> and there was. Yeah. There was. Yeah, it was uh, McDonald's was down on the end and the way was in the middle and everything else got tore up. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't know anything about the, the politics of rioting or anything. We were young. Um, and and I, 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 I'm starting to remember now because remember Jesse had Jesse had that that deuce and a quarter, that 67 deuce and a quarter with the taggers on the on the, the streamers on the and the mud flaps. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, it was 67 jam. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yep. So my father, um, my father tinkered with music as well. And um he was around the house making noise. <laughs> Back then it still didn't relate to me as music. <laughs> but you know, he he did what he did and um he had some good equipment. Um years passed, things happened at the house and um my mother became a single parent. Mm -hmm. And Terry commandeered the uh equipment that was left there. And well, he had a he had a pretty decent guitar, but he had broken the, the top two strings on it. So I only had the four bass strings, E A D G. And that's what I started playing around with and, and learned, you know, a couple songs on there, playing playing them one stringers. Um, and that's where I started playing the bass. But before that, my uncle who played good guitar, uh, like real Mississippi down home, like real nasty stuff. He was teaching me, my uncle Pete was teaching me in Omaha how to play a little bit, but that stuff was frustrating. So uh, that's, that's where I started picking up guitar. So continue Jerome. And, and mind you, every summer we were taken to Arkansas to stay there for the summers. So we would jump in the car and uh, I remember the Impala, I remember the 65 Impala, and we would drive all the way from Omaha to the South and dropped off and picked up three months later. <laughs> 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 but you know, it, it was it was growth for us. So we're over Minneapolis um, and, and Terry's uh, indulging in this music uh, quest and getting better and you know i i wasn't into to music like that i love music but um i wasn't uh forced or had the desire to to learn anything now and and once we got to high school even in elementary school and 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 middle school um we were required in minneapolis to take music classes you um you had to start out with this instrument called the recorder and they assign you a, a recorder and you had to hold on to that pretty much for the whole year or you would get in trouble and you will learn many songs on it even in our schools um, um like i went to a, a elementary school called willard i remember um you know the michael jackson songs uh the, the spinners and all those songs those songs they had to go through uh uh, a panel before we could even listen to them or sing them in classes because they were saying that they were uh, what uh, too adult for us to repeat the lyrics but we could sing some risque. muskrat sally yeah risque <laughs> uh, but we could sing muskrat sally and muskrat sam did a little thing in muskrat lamb you know <laughs> um, things like that but so so moving forward getting into high school going to get the uh the 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 the, the diploma for 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 your secondary studies uh, there was really a mandatory thing for language you had to take a couple of language classes music was a must music was definite and yeah how that how it, that's changed a lot Oof. but the music was a yeah you had to take music i remember that, that was and cool. all and all of this was happening on the north side north yep. side of minneapolis and two blocks up from where we were at um 
was was Plymouth Avenue. And Plymouth Avenue was a, a, a boulevard that ran straight through the heart of, of Minneapolis. Um, towards the end, you, you had a, a kind of a, kind of a well-to-do area, wealthy area called Xerxes and Worth Park area. You had some of your um, popular, your world popular Vikings that lived down there, um, interracial uh, couples, and you had the golf course. And then as you came for further uh, east, you started getting into a, a little more cultural uh, existence there. Um, Jelly Bean. We, we call that the good. They, they, they got, it was the hood. To, it was the good. To the good. Jelly Bean lived close to the to, to the well to do stuff. Mm -hmm. But that block made a difference. <laughs> By the way, uh, what I remember about North Side, because it was like this on some of the South Side streets, all the streets were in alphabetical order, right? Yes. Not on the north side. Exactly. Right? I, I remember that because that's how I always knew how to get around. And by the time you got to Xerxes, which was the X, then you knew that was about as far as you were going to go. Right? Yeah. Everything that ran north and south were alphabetical. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. Alphabetical and east and west was numerical. Yes. Yep. Which I actually, I, as a kid, I love that because it made it easy. You know, as a kid riding the bus around everywhere, mm -hmm. I could and always you, tell where I was at. Because I just knew, okay, well, the next street's going to be the B Street or the C Street or the, you know, Colfax or Dumont or DuPont or, you know, whatever. Yeah. It was yeah. some, uh, did you, did you try to, all of those, you know. Did you try to use that theory when you moved to L.A.? <laughs> <laughs> I swear. You know what's really funny about that? I was so lost when we moved to L.A., man. I was so lost because there was no rhyme or reason. I Because I was used to, yeah, the streets went in order, you yep. know. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then the everything was in alphabetical order if it was a name. And I was like, okay, yeah, I got this. And then you know, you get to LA and you got rodeo, like rodeo, rodeo drive, yeah. and then you got rodeo, rodeo, <laughs> same spelling, but you know, you're in a whole different place. It was rodeo for like, a long like time, Jesus right? and Jesus and Jesus, Jesus, right? <laughs> Quite different people. Yeah. <laughs> And then you get the long name like Avocado Street. Yeah. And well, the names you can't even pronounce what they are. You don't even know what the heck they are. El and then you Spendo. have like, and then you have like streets like Beverly, but there's Beverly Boulevard and there's Beverly Drive. Drive, and it's like, wait a minute. The only place worse than that, by the way, is Atlanta, because everything's Peachtree. Oh, Peachtree. And I remember West. people used to tell us, man, yeah, you just take Peachtree down the like which one? Road lane, <laughs> like, everything was peach. And you know, it's funny we experienced that together. <laughs> yes, yes, we experienced that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I attended uh, a high school, same high school that Terry attended, North High, Minneapolis. Polars. Um, oh, one of my friends, one of my friends who has become uh, one of the most sought after uh, production manager for touring groups. His name is uh, James McGregor. We call him Magoo. Uh, he's done uh, production managing for, for Janet at some point and Beyonce. And his sister's also in the, the, the entertainment industry doing some, some work as well. Well, Magoo was a good friend of mine from, from high school and childhood. And uh, we had college career day and we started visiting colleges together. And we ended up going to down to Ames, Iowa, which was like three and a half, four hours away from Minneapolis. And uh, went down there and investigated a, a summer program for, for, for school, for college. Um, I also wanted to pursue football as well. So they, they enticed me and, and I, I drank the Kool-Aid and, and got drunk and I went on down there and, and joined the football team and got to play with some amazing players. Um, uh, Aubrey Volius, uh, Rocky Gillis, Dwayne Crutchfield, Ron Harris, Stallworth, a lot of these guys, a lot of guys came out of Omaha as well. And they knew my family out of Omaha as well. They knew my older brother who was a, uh, who became a big eight official and, uh, ended up uh, retiring from the, the NFL two years ago. 
So we're proud of that as well. So yeah, I used to love <laughs> watching him at the games. Yeah. yeah. And um, so me and Magoo, we attended Iowa State. Uh, Magoo became a, a team manager for the football team. I, I joined the squad. Uh, limited time, but I, I created problems. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I had people looking over their shoulders. They made a mistake. What was your I, nickname? They named the nickname you? Uh, my coach was uh, Donnie Duncan, bless his soul. He, he's gone now, But and and Mac Brown. Uh, Donnie Duncan named me Bullet. And that's because I was pretty fast. Not as fast as Terry, but I was pretty fast. Like you were absolutely quick. I could take off on you <laughs> and laugh at you. <laughs> <laughs> but I could count the steps, and then that gorilla would jump on my back. <laughs> But um, I did a, I did, I did good there. Um, I was, I lasted two years, and I, I came home. Um, I fell in love, and uh, uh, I followed that feeling instead of taking care of me. Well, I thought I was taking care of me, but mm -hmm. I, I, I followed a false feeling, and um, ended up coming home. I started working, and and Terry and and and. And the band had been together for many, many, many years uh, as flight time. They had Cynthia Johnson in there. They had Greg Williamson uh, as a lead singer. That was uh, he's a star on Baywatch. He's the only black guy on Baywatch for a long time. Um, uh, had Alexander O'Neill, of course, uh, who is the famous Alexander O'Neill. Uh, oh, and, you know, they they had a lot of folks come through Rocky Robbins. Come, hung, came and hung out, and across town, Jimmy Jam had his band happening and and popping and and doing things. Um, and let me back up just a little bit. During that period of time, um, as a a young a teenager, I would go out to the clubs. Me, Magoo, and the rest of our boys, we would go down to the club and we would dance. We would just we would just hook up and and just dance while Jimmy Jam was spinning as the the, the the most popular DJ in Minneapolis in the most popular club in Minneapolis. Um, there was no liquor served in the club, but you could swear there was alcohol being served because the club was packed every night. The club's name was uh, Dance Track, right? Disco Track. Disco Track. Disco, Disco. Track. Mm -hmm. And um, the owners, they were they were really cool. Jam, Jam had a following that was beyond belief. Studio 54, shoot, we, we had disco track. <laughs> and, yep. and it was it was a, a great experience. But that was kind of the time that I had honed in on my dancing and stuff. So right after that, me and Magoo both went down to Iowa State and we were attending parties and stuff and doing little corny dances down there. So I came back and I was working. Terry and Jimmy Jam had joined the group after a while, and um, I guess they were approached by Prince about the time. And somewhere they worked the deal. I wasn't around for that period of time, but once uh, they accepted the deal, Terry uh, asked Prince to, to give me a job as a roadie. Now, throughout my last years of high school, I was a roadie for flight time. I would move the equipment. Yeah, and, I was going to say that. I remember. And, and uh, a good friend of mine, Princey Roy Curtis, uh, he's a, a young man that, that Terry brought home, he and his brother, uh, when I was, I think, 10 years old. He brought home uh, as a, uh, he, 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 was, he was dating somebody. He, he was holding hands with somebody <laughs> at that time. Huh. These are my little brothers, man. Actually, your father was like a real cool, like back in that day, I didn't really have a father figure. And the guys that filled that, that, that space were um, Mr. Curtis, one, he used to call me Big Hat, because I always used to wear that big flop hat. He used to come to my track meets. And uh, Ray Island, uh, David Island, Batman's father. Yes. And they used to come watch my track meets and, you know, mentor me. 
as a young man and kind of keep me in line when no one else could, I guess. I was a little frisky. Right, right. And frisky. And speaking on Dave Island, when when I was a roadie, um, I had earned the right to, to drive the bus that they had. Uh, Flight Time always had a big red bus. Oh, and yeah. they, they gave me the keys and myself and Princey, Roy Curtis, would go load the equipment up while Terry and everybody else did their, their daily chores and worked. And we would pick the equipment up and we would go set it up at clubs for them. And they would come in and we have it halfway hooked up, right? <laughs> but we did the heavy lifting for them. So that turned into something that Terry offered Prince that I had the, the, the ability to do it was to move the equipment and, and handle things and run errands and all those things. So they hired me as that, uh, a roadie. Yeah, I remember I remember asking Prince that, like, because yeah, Rome, you, you had always come out. I remember um, when I got the opportunity to do that Sam and Dave thing, man. Mm -hmm. And we got in my little, what was that, that Dodge Coat? That Dodge <laughs> Coat. Station wagon, we loaded that thing up, man, and we went all around, over the country. All over the country with Jason Sam and Brown, Dave. Sam and Dave. And, 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 uh, and uh, Sam still calls. Oh, yes. And Sam's great. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, I asked Prince, I said, yo, man, get my brother a job. And he said, well, what can he do? I said, well, he's always set up the equipment for us, man. Just, you know, as long as it can. Well, what can he do here? I said, well, he could just set up the equipment you know, whatever, because he had been setting up the equipment for flight time. And when we converted to the time, everything from flight time just became the time. So it was, it was just a, the only thing that we got new was some OB-8s. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And an attitude. Yeah, <laughs> OB-8s and an attitude. Yeah. <laughs> that made the OB-8s bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I didn't know. Well, you inherited some great, great songs, some great music, some great productions. So, yeah, absolutely. And a mentor that had a great whip. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yep. So we're, so we're we're moving into the rehearsal period, and um, <laughs> there's a scene that 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 Prince used in Under the Cherry Moon. Um, we were rehearsing over by the University of Minnesota in St. Paul. Southeast Minneapolis, and we were rehearsing, and everybody's sitting around talking on a break, and all of a sudden a bat starts flapping around in the rehearsal. <laughs> everybody ducks and starts screaming at that, like women, like white girls, <laughs> and they they start covering their hair, hands up, their hair up, and running around in a room and then they eventually find their way out the door <laughs> and prince is right there with them too screaming like a woman ah! yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they get outside i run outside and they're like we can't go back in there we can't go back in there and i remember saying ah, i'll go get it out and terry said don't go in there i said i got it i got it i grabbed the towel went in there and the back came started swooping around swooping around and he messed up. He hit the wall <laughs> and then hit the ground. So I threw a towel over him, took him out, took him outside and let him go. And everybody's looking at me and saying, you're crazy. You're crazy. That scene was part of Under the Cherry Moon where we were in the courtyard and he's talking about he's not afraid of anything. And my line was, you're afraid of bats? And he looks up and he took that whole scenario from rehearsal and added it into the, the restaurant scene. That's funny, man. So yeah, that, that no joke, man. Yeah, yeah, Prince was no, no joke either, man. That dude, he could take something that he saw, heard, um, witnessed anything and convert it into something that was special, man, that dude. Right. Just had such a gift. Yep. After a while, after hanging around Prince for so long, I would know when he was contemplating something because he would just do this. And the next thing you know, 
it's um it's a song <laughs> or seen in a in a video or something. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I, I remember we were out in the, on the first tour and we everywhere we would stop. Uh, this was the time when HBO was just starting, and every city HBO would come on and they would show uh, a series on Nostradamus. Yep. And we would uh, be talking about, you know, the end times and, you know, the world was going to end in 1999. Yeah, he would ride our bus and, and drill us on it. Yeah, uh, man, we, we heard that stuff for like months in a row. And next thing you know, we got home. Man. Yeah, 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 there you go. <laughs> he converted that thing into a, a, a brilliant song. Yes, he did. Already a brilliant story. Uh, he, he is. Uh, he was. Uh, he was amazing. He was amazing. So, so but now. By, by the way, Jerome, now you got you got to tell the story though of the transition from the roadie part. That's where I told because him. okay because remember I remember we went we went on that on that Chitlin tour that we called it the Chitlin tour where we had the two station wagons. Uh -huh. We yeah. were down south. Yeah. And what was yeah. the guy? What was what was the dude's name? The other the roadie guy that Buck? was driving the truck? Oh, Mitch. 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 Yeah. And I and I just remember at one point in time you were like, I can't, I'm done with this. I'm not I'm not doing this. Anymore. I'm done. I'm gonna beat his <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but tell tell that story about how we first our first little chitlin tour, because it because it started to make the progression from, you know, the well, roadie to the after nearly. after the after the band was received um there was a uh junket tour that was put together for us to go down south and um i was happy you know i was going to be driving a truck cross country with this english guy that's been out with kiss and big rock groups i mean popular rock groups but i'm still i'm still operating off of that soft peter and that stuff that they fed us at Iowa State, and I'm still cocky. I don't care. I'm with my brothers. You know, they cocky. And I'm, I'm, you know, I, I move the equipment, and I, I go dress up like them, and hang yep. out with them. Yep. And um, but um, I'm driving cross country, and um, we stop somewhere in Milwaukee, or right outside of Milwaukee, and he gives me my key to the room. And um, he gives me my key to the room, and then he goes to his room. I jump in the shower. I'm taking a shower, and I feel something cold. I'm like, what's going on? I'm washing some more and pour some. I, I feel something else cold, and I, and I see a shadow outside my, my curtain. So I open the curtain back, and he's back there laughing and giggling and pouring beer on me. That, that, that bothered me. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> Beer on me? Oh, no, 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 that, that ain't happening. So the scenario um, was exchanged with, um, with Prince. And after we got down on the, uh, on the road, we got past that little junket. He said, you're no longer going to do that you're going to just take care of the band. And um, I became a roadie at that. I mean, it became like a bodyguard of valet. Yeah, valet. Mm -hmm. a, a valet at that Valet time. was appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, but see, but, but what got you there truly was something that happened in rehearsal. Right. That, so you got to so, go back. You got to so back. This was before, this is before we jumped on the truck and I got uh, christened with beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We have to go back to rehearsal. We had to go back to yeah. rehearsal. We, we were doing back to rehearsal. Cool. Yeah. And and they're rehearsing and doing choreography. I'm doing choreography with them on the side and just enjoying it. And, and you know, after listening to the song 24, 11 times, you know, they're not making any mistakes. They're doing everything they're supposed to do. So Prince comes in and they're running the show. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to grab this because I had developed somewhat of some 
wiggle room with Prince to fool around with, with gesturing and stuff. So Moore says, somebody bring me a mirror. And I timed it perfectly to get the mirror off the wall and run up to Morris and put it in front of him. And he does his primping in it and everything. While he's doing that, Prince is sitting there and he just busts out laughing. He rolls on the floor. He said, ah, ah, stop, stop. The band was equipped to be able to stop. He said, do it again, do it again. And we did it probably, what, 15 times. Mm, yeah. And Prince said, that's going in the show. That's what you, I want you to do every time. What happened was I put the mirror in front of Morris and Morris responded and reacted as Morris does. And that created a, uh, an amazing relationship with us. It, it opened the portal of, of our camaraderie of who we were and it can't be replaced. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was an amazing day. I remember that so vividly yeah and and I, and I was and to this day the thing the thing that was so funny about it was the size of the mirror was so huge because it yeah. wasn't like a you know it wasn't like the little mirror it was funny we put up the cool video today earlier and uh you know you're holding that little mirror that you could hold in one hand mm -hmm. this was a big wall mirror yeah you it took was, off the wall it was like it was like two by three like two by three feet. Yeah, it was maybe big. maybe three by. It was like the posters behind. Yeah, it was, about, it was almost like a three by four or something. It was big. It's like it was huge. and yeah, it was made out of plaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was ornate, <laughs> ornate. Yeah, with some gold ornate, and you know, kind of, kind of, like the titty lamps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the titty. So tell the titty lamp story for people that don't know the the titty lamp story. Well, well the, the titty lamp, um, Weaver, Weaver owned this club called Nakarima. Nakarima is American spelled backwards. It was no, 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 no. Leonard Weaver didn't own Nakarima. Oh. That was that was Chuck. Uh, Leonard Weaver owned, uh, what was it? The Yasm. Uh, the Yasm. 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 The Young African American, American Society of Men. Society of Men, yeah, something like that. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm down on Fourth Avenue. We up on Lake Street. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Least, yeah, yeah. I, I got mixed up there, but Leonard Weaver and Yasms. Um, Leonard, he had this, this thing that he he liked this plaster stuff, but he liked it because he was painting them and selling them, and he had ornate mirrors, which, which he painted in gold brocade. And he had uh, picture frames that he painted. And he also had these lamps. And they were probably about two and a half feet tall. And they had recesses all over them <laughs> yep. that, he, that he painted. And, and he loved it. He would, you know, he would he didn't want you to get close to him at all because he's like you break it you buy it yeah so yeah he had he had two things he said he said two conditions for us being working in the club or not working in the club but rehearsing in his club don't touch my titty lamps and don't touch my juice machine, juice machine. <laughs> that was the other thing the juice machine and the titty lamps yeah. that was all he cared don't touch those things so that's the setup yeah, so there was a violation on both. <laughs> and uh, because of the, the titty lamp, the thirst that these guys had, that was a major violation. But I think the titty lamp really crossed the line because <laughs> the titty lamp was the end, end all be all. And mind you, just so you guys know, like Leonard Weaver was, he was a, down at the, uh, what was it the taste? Taste. He was a bodyguard at the taste or a bouncer at the taste. And, and Jimmy Jam, Jimmy Jam uh DJ there too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. But I saw him one night. We came out on a break and somebody came down the street talking trash. And you know, somebody was at the door trying to get in. And 
then the Weaver was telling him to leave. And the guy come down the street talking trash about Weaver and says something to him. And Leonard Weaver had these big clogs on, you know, like people wear now, like the, what do they call those things? Donnie Simpson likes them, to wear those things. Them Uggs? No, the, the, not no, Uggs. No, but, no. Yeah. Those, yeah, they're big. Um, they look like. Called. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dutch, yeah. Dutch yeah. shoes. Dutch looking shoes, yeah. But he had some of those on, but they were big leather things with fur and stuff all around them. They just looked like some big beaver so to speak yeah, mind you, he was just like a pimp too though oh yeah we were, was cold blood he was stocky and he was short though but man this dude kept talking trash crocs yeah crocs, crocs. yeah, they look the, like yeah crocs. I'm, looking, I'm looking at the chat somebody says crocs okay yeah, yeah they're crocs, crocs. So y'all yeah. forgive Thank me for because them things that's some ugly shit right there <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's okay they, they they feel comfortable though i get it but he he was they were talking trash to, to Weaver. So the dude that just was coming down the street, he walked up and act like he was gonna push up. Man, Weaver hit this dude so hard. I'd never seen anybody in my life get hit like this dude got hit. This dude flew about five feet in the air and slid on the concrete sidewalk until he stopped probably about seven feet away. Mm -hmm. And everybody was laughing. You know how, <laughs> how we get boys. <laughs> yeah. Because you shouldn't be talking shit to people. Oh, you just man. shouldn't do that. And you, you know, know, you know what was deceiving about Weaver too. Remember, he had something wrong with his hip. Remember, he had a little. Oh limp. yeah, he walked with a little limp. Uh huh. Oh, you're like, oh, I can take him. Oops. Yeah, take him yeah. where? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Weaver hit dude so hard. I had never seen anything like that before. Yeah. And from that point on, I had the utmost respect for Weaver. I was like, yeah, okay, we know not to mess with Weaver. We know not to mess with Weaver. So and when he, he said, don't break my titty lamps yeah. and don't get in my juice, I remember Jesse used to go in that juice every day. He'd be standing up in that juice machine trying to get <laughs> juice. And then pouring water back Pour in. Water. And <laughs> have, yeah, the, the, the juice machine, the juice would be, there was like two of them, right? It was like a red one and kind of a pink one, right? Yeah. Right. And, and it would be in there, right? And and so Jesse would go in and he'd like take some juice out of there. And we go like, Jesse, man, no, no, don't be in the juice machine, man. He's like, oh, cool. And then Jesse would take it. And then you'd notice that the level would be going down. And so then he'd pour water in there to make it look like nothing was there. But then it started looking all watered down. Yeah. So that you could tell that somebody was messing with the juice machine. We were like, oh, shit. We knew as soon as we were walked in, it was going to be some stuff. Yeah. And, and he used to come in and talk about, who yeah. been in my juice who machine? Who been in my juice machine? He would fuss, he would fuss <laughs> all the time. Yep. But he didn't have any malice towards us. You no, know, he loved us because on the weekends, we bring in that crowd. We bring in that crowd. Yeah, he, he let, bring it, in he that let crowd. us rehearse during the weekdays. And then on the weekends, he opened it up and we play. Yeah, so, we were doing we were doing that after hours thing. We would start mm -hmm. like eleven o'clock, eleven to four, or something like that. We'd be in there yep. gigging, and everybody from every club would come up in there, man. So, oh yeah, yeah, he was getting that that weekend crowd. So he loved us for that. But we was tearing that juice machine up. And you know, every rehearsal, um, the band had to set up, and then break down. So I was left in charge of getting stuff back in order. That's how I broke the titty lamp. <laughs> and I stacked it up and made it look like it was. <laughs> I tried to piece it back together. I didn't. I didn't want to take that ass whooping from Weaver. Yeah, but I thought you did it. I thought you did it when you were putting the mirror back because you used to grab that yeah, mirror. That's, off that's the what wall. I thought yeah, too. Yeah, that's what it was. Oh man, you put the, putting the mirror back on the wall that you were showing the Morris, right? Exactly at the end of the rehearsals. Yeah, but uh -huh. the funny thing about it was that I, I what I remember was you put the titty lamp back together and it's so dark in that place because it was the walls were all black. Everything was black in there. Everything was black. So I'm figuring he's not even going to notice that. You'll never notice that, right? Shoot. He came in and immediately, who been in my juice machine? And we're like, what, are you, what are you talking about? And then he goes, like from way across the room, who fuck with my titty lamp? <laughs> what are you talking about? How do you see that? How do you know somebody messed with your titty lamp? Oh yeah, man. Oh, oh my god. And, and just so y'all understand what the setting of this was, this is like the, if there is a, a traditional look of a black club, 
Like you got the the red carpet, the, carpet. <laughs> the black walls, everything's black in there. And if you turn the lights on, you just feel dirty. <laughs> you feel, <laughs> you dirty. feel slimy. Yeah, you never turn the lights on because you don't want to feel that slime. Yeah. But it was it was black and red, and the tables were black. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the chairs were black. It was just black and red everywhere. Titty lamps with gold mirrors and stuff on the side. Yes, it was awesome. <laughs> Yep, and and that was a uh, it was a uh, that was a cool journey there too, because uh, yeah. we were special at that time. We were very special. That was 1980. Yeah, well, we we didn't know we had nothing special. We just just felt good about just playing, man. We just loved to play. Right. right. We play anywhere uh, for for anybody, man. Mm -hmm. Even playing at the Nakarima Club, you know, on the weekends, and folks start shooting up in there. I remember one time they start shooting up in there and. I think Morris was on the stage with us too, Sue Ann Carwell. And man, shit, it was packed. And I don't know how we did it, but we were outside in the front of the club before everybody got out. <laughs> we, we ran past everybody so fast with yeah. instruments from behind the drums and playing. We were outside before everybody else when they started shooting up in there, man. It was it was crazy back in those days. You guys, you guys put the work in. You guys put the work in. We loved it. It didn't even feel like work, quite honestly. And the other thing we always tell people all the time is that we, you know, all the money we made, because we were actually making a little bit of money, but we were putting it right back into your equipment, more equipment. getting mm -hmm. better keyboards, better sound systems, better microphones, better stuff. And I remember the thing that you always used to make us mad is that when we would set up all the equipment and stuff, you know, we, you know, you you help us do it, but we'd be setting up equipment and stuff. But I remember back in the day, back in the flight time day before the time day I remember alexander o'neill would walk in with a microphone then that would be his that would be his thing <laughs> and we'd be and b would be in there struggling with dr drums and everybody would terry would have his big ass custom amp and or whatever he was playing back in that time and it was like you know and we had keyboards and trying to break down fender it, Rhodes pianos and bringing in the organ and the leslie yes the organ and the leslie i mean come on man <laughs> I know it would be like walking in like and then we, and so when the gig was over, we'd all still be there and he'd be like, all right, catch y'all, uh, you know, whatever. And we'd be like, what the hell? We, we, we used to have to go at it, man. I used to go at it with Alex about that, man. Say, OK, well, I'm I'm, I'm going to find you if you don't come move this equipment. Well, you know, yeah. why should I get to have to move? The, well, I said, well, you had to move the PA system. You used it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see, I, see, yo, Xander, you know, see, yo, Xander, he had to move no equipment because, you know, all he uses the microphone. Uh, okay. I remember. <laughs> I remember. I remember those those nights in like three or four o'clock in the morning with when you and Batman and Tony and Tom, Tom Lund, yeah, the guitar players. Um, they would uh, be in the driveway sometimes on blistering nights with snow, snow three feet high in the driveway, and had to carry that stuff in. Back down in the basement, man. Yeah, after, after Terry had driven the bus across town in the snow and around snow banks and and backing it into a driveway to, it, it, it was a, it was a journey. It was a journey. Yeah, absolutely. Was a well, remember, we used to rehearse at our house for a while. Yeah. Mostly we rehearsed at we were we rehearsed at Be Jelly Beans house sometimes. Uh huh. Davis house most of the time. Right. And then we started rehearsing at our house in our little basement down there with, yeah. with all the uh what are those the uh, things with the, the lot of legs. Uh, uh, centerpiece. Yeah, the centerpiece. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And every 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 time we start playing, man, we get out there playing. The mama would stab on the floor. <laughs> Three stomps, boom, boom, boom. Turn that shit down. <laughs> Yeah, she did. Yeah, she, she did. was doing that all night long. Turn that shit down. Yeah, she she worked hard, and we became numb to all that fussing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she, man, she be a, man trying to get us out of that basement. She's like, nah, y'all can't rehearse here no more. Yeah, no, she didn't even call it rehearsal. She down there making all that damn noise. Damn noise. <laughs> 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 it, it took her a long time to believe what we were doing too, huh, Tari? Oh yeah. Well, you know, but but as any good mother knows, it's like that keeps you off the street. So 
Yes. It keeps you out of mischief, man. It keeps your mind sharp. Um, you know, gives you a purpose. So she allowed us to be there, even though she, she was working three jobs, man. So I, I, you know, I can't blame her for wanting to get her sleep, but whew, we, we came through some rough ones with her. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and yes, I remember, I remember um, going to pick Jam up to, to go to rehearsal as well. And, and Mama Jam bringing me in. I would go over there on purpose a little bit early because she would pamper me. <laughs> <laughs> and Mama Jam was sweet. She was all. Oh, she loves so, some Jerome, boy. Oh, she yeah. loves Jerome. And um, like I said, I would go over there on purpose to uh, 25, 30 minutes before I was supposed to be over there. <laughs> he, would, he would stuff me with food. And um, yeah, that, that, was, that was a great time. What and, kind of car were you driving back then? Roman. I was driving Terry's car. Which was what though? What was he driving? What were you what? driving, Terry? Do you remember back he then? He had a couple of different cars. Man, I don't know, man. I there I was probably an A-track that was whistling in there. The great, yeah, was the great? Had an A-track whistling. In there. Was it oh, Grand Prix? Uh, yeah, I might have had a Grand Prix. Yeah, I Grand had Prix. The, that might have been, been the mean been. green. The mean green grab. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. mean green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was I love that car. That car was Fast as hell, but I had them tires on there that was bald as you know what. <laughs> but it's like, like if I would have hit a rock on the the uh, on the freeway, I probably would be on the moon right now because <laughs> I would have flew away because that that those tires were bald, bald. And, but that car was really fast. And every yeah. car that Terry owned, he handed me the car keys to, and he trusted me to drive it. So. That's that's my big brother, y'all. I love that man. Well, you know, you gotta trust your bro. He trusted me. Sure. Probably when Full he should. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so so Rome, so so going ahead, and by the way, there's there's a bunch of great questions and, and stuff that we'll we'll get to in just a second. But uh -huh. we we're enjoying just reminiscing and, and stuff. I'm glad you guys are here checking it out. Um also, because this is fun. We we enjoy doing this. Um but I just wanted to say, when we got to the point of after the YASM happened, and obviously everything changed once our record came out, you know, right. once Get It Up came out and all of that. And I remember at this point now, you're the valet, but you're the mirror man. You're no longer moving equipment at this point. So right. now you're actually the mirror man. And I remember when we started doing our first little I remember when we did like the Roxy in uh -huh. L.A., that was like, I think our first like gig that we actually right. did in LA, the kind of our big time gig that we did. But I remember when we were divvying up rooms, like who was going to stay with who? Right. Because we were going to be two to a room, except Morris got his own room because he was, right. you know, the star, star of the show. How did, do you remember how we ended up getting together? Did we just naturally get together as, as roommates or, or how did that happen? What, what no, happened? no, I, I know that story. The story was you were Jesse's roommate at first. Yeah, you were Jesse's roommate. And Jerome was rooming with the roadie. I was rooming with the roadie. Oh, I didn't know that. And yep. you guys knew that. Okay. And nobody and I think wanted I was to room with, with Jesse. I was rooming with Monty at first, I think. Nope. I remember. Oh wait, was that that hotel? I think I pass it all the time. That's that hotel. This is what that's that that circle hotel we were staying at. There was like Beverly Garden. Yeah, and they yeah. handed out the um, the right. They handed out the rooming sheets. Yep. Yeah. So so <laughs> what happened? Like, right. What happened was you couldn't take it after the first couple of days. That's exactly. Right. That's and, right. And, and and so when Jerome moved up from roadie to valet, he started rooming with you, and and I raised my hand to, to do the mission impossible. <laughs> and room with Jesse. I, I room with Jesse. Yes. Yep. That's how it happened. Oh my God. That's right. Yeah. I took yep. the mission impossible. So so everyone knows I took the mission because Jesse, when Jesse moved to Minneapolis, he he was like a, an orphan in Minneapolis. So he didn't really have a place to live. So he came and stayed at my house. Yeah. Right. Wow. So, so you, you know he became one of my brothers too. So. Absolutely love Jesse, but that's a hard brother to live with, man. <laughs> <laughs> you have to draw the boundaries. You want to love him from afar. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, especially with living conditions. You know, I can I can do anything publicly or be around people publicly, man, but 
where I lay my head, man, it's got to be some peace there. <laughs> and, and, and you know, you guys, um, Terry's real name is Job. Mm -hmm. Job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Biblical Job. Because <laughs> he got the patience. He can he can deal with things. Um, uh, that used to be. I don't know or, about now. <laughs> or, or over, you used over it all up? You, you I think used so. a lot of it up. On those two, on the, and that first time tour, I know you used a lot of that patience. Oh yeah, well, well it got to the point where where I had to I, I had to stage the uh, what is it, the insurrection against <laughs> <laughs> against the White House. <laughs> if I can't get my own room, I said I saved enough money I can get home from anywhere in the United States on a Greyhound bus. I checked, and, and that's what he told him. If I can't get my own room. Then I'm going home. Well, we can't afford to give you your own room. <laughs> we were supposed to get a raise. We, we need to get our own room. Like right. every man, every man deserves deserves his own space. Like, you know, we're in rehearsals, we're doing interviews, we're doing everything together. I just want space where I don't have to sit with somebody else's girlfriends, or I can walk in my room and I don't have to see people's friends in my room, like all touching my shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> hey man, is this yours? This is really nice. Man, if y'all don't, you know, how you talk to, through your teeth, you, man, if you don't get your own ass. <laughs> Somebody gonna die. This, this ain't gonna happen. No <laughs> You're right. You know, so it, used, it got to that point where it was just, uh, it was intolerable. I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate it anymore. It's like, okay. Yeah, well, that boy, that boycott worked because we ended up getting our own rooms. We sure did. Yeah. So that was cool. But me, me and Rome, I don't think Rome. I don't remember us ever really arguing about anything. No. Man. We, we, we had a no. We all, we were all on the same page about it. We were, we were, we, we enjoy each other's time. Um, I was young still, learning things. Oh yeah. Um, and I had yeah. to make sure I got along with folks and. Um, but you were easy to get along. We were, you were like a brother, you know. I knew who you were and accepted you. I was picking you up every day for rehearsal. Yeah. Um, you know, why would I forsake that for some BS on the road? Uh, uh. Anything on the road is not as valuable as what we had going in our pocket of people. Yeah, but yeah, I agree. But I, I, I think we were, but we were also, I think, naturally compatible. Exactly. Like just, you know, we would have chill people. Mm -hmm. What yeah. do you say? You, both of you guys are very chill people. Jer Jerome's yeah. a, a bit more high strung on the other end. Now, mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know, Jerome is, I mean, I guess our family, we've got to come from a fighter family. Mm -hmm. But he's high strung. He's ready to fight at the drop of a, a pin, anything. Like he, he's ready to jump in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. That's kind of the vibe. But that was the vibe in our house. And like, we have like three of us are that are like that, and the other two are just very <laughs> docile. They just mm, whatever. But there's three of us that will fight at the drop of a hat. It's like yeah. okay. And and, and what y'all don't know about Terry, he's gone to classrooms and snatched people out of classrooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I I go by the code. I believe I'm like the three hundred. You know, be careful with your words because you're going to be held accountable. Yeah. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Right. So if you say something that that's offensive to me, then I'm going to address that to a point, you know. And if if you have said something that's past that point, then it's a. Uh, I heard this the other night. You know, we negotiate uh, with words or whatever, and after that, we negotiate with these. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the way it used to be, you know. You negotiate with the words, and you know, renegotiate with these. It's like, okay, come on with it. Let's do this. Because no, it's like you, you, like you said, you always used to say, "T, like freedom of speech." Yeah, you, you free to say what you want, but I'm also free to kick your ass if I don't like what you. That's, say. that's right. <laughs> yeah. Freedom don't come free, bro. That's right. If you think something that you know that much, you you care about it that much, keep it to yourself. Yeah. yeah. And because I'm because I I have a, a fuse like that, I I exercise kindness constantly. Mm -hmm. I exercise it because 
some folks, you know, even more so now these days, they, they step across that boundary and they disrespect uh, to, to this crazy place. And um, I, I count to 10. Yeah, well, <laughs> you have to said, people wake up these days. Want to be offended. Wanting to be offended. Like you almost wake up and you go, Okay, what am I? What can I go be offended about today? What can I complain about? It's yeah. all—it's all somebody else's fault. Right. But the problem is, is wherever you go, that's where you're going to be, and there's always going to be a problem because you got a bad you, ass. Because you the problem. You the problem. <laughs> I, I didn't tell—I didn't tell you, Tari, about the, the situation at a gas station. Nobody had a mask on except me. The guy, the guy walks up to me and says, "Why you got a mask on?" And I ignored him. He said, you heard me talking to you. I said, I got this mask on so they won't know who I am after I beat your ass. <laughs> right. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Good answer. And he just started blinking. He, he looked like somebody was blowing sand in his eyes. He started blinking like that. <laughs> yeah, so, well, why don't you have a mask on? <laughs> uh, give me $200 worth of gas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's yeah. crazy, man. That's crazy. Ooh, I, I walked to the car, though. I walked to the car watching him, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you never know. You never exactly. know, man. People are nuts. But, but we grew up in the era, though, uh, of uh, there was no threats. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> you just did what you did. Like, okay. Oh, so you're going to do? Oh, oh, you threatening? Oh, okay. You, that was never tolerated. That was never acceptable. No, we're yeah. not violent. No, yeah, yeah, nobody wants to go there, but you know, I'm not gonna let you get me first. That was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you're there's gonna come up talking to me and I'm gonna turn my head and you're gonna cold cock me. I'm no that's not gonna happen. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Not this life. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of great times, man. A lot of great music, man. Hey man, tell us a little bit about Cherry Moon. That that was uh that wow. was cool, cool, yeah, man. we got a lot of questions about that in, in the chat. Talk about that experience. Now, I'm I'm going to lead up into that. Okay. Um, Prince put me in the family after the time broke up. Yes. Um, that was the time, the same period of time where he started developing under the cherry moon and took me, I mean, right, right up under his wing and was taking a lot of creative from me to put that together. Um, he um, took me to Europe because he said he wanted to cast out of Europe. And we went to, 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 to France and we met with uh, Christian Scott Thomas. And we sat there and, and had dinner and drank probably thousand dollar bottle bottles of champagne and i'm sitting with her and she's got this really really strong beautiful accent that english accent <laughs> and she's talking and, and i'm drinking and you know it starts to twist a little bit <laughs> and i start making fun of of, of her and her accent and her enunciation on some words were just crazy. And she called me a ninny. <laughs> you know, plain. Yeah. I said, what's a ninny? You don't know what a ninny is. I said, no, I don't know what a ninny. And I bet you she, I said, it's Princeton. I bet you she don't know what a record store is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how the record store scene came. Yeah. So Prince expounded on that and wrote that into the script of Under the Cherry Moon. Um, Under the Cherry Moon took place in the south of France, in Nice. Um, uh, Steve Fagnoli, Bob Cravalho, and Joe Ruffalo um, were managing Prince at that time. And um, this was slated to be a really big film. Um, Prince went all out for this. Uh, he brought in Mary Lambert to, to direct. Um, we flew to Nice, got set up in St. Paul de Vence. We stayed at Joan Collins' uh, home in St. Paul de Vence. And um, 
Steve Fagnoli had this 180 foot yacht that moored the Mediterranean Sea up and down from Monte Carlo to Antibes. And we had access to that. We would go out before production started. Um, Michael Bauhaus was the cinematographer. Mary Lambert started out as director. Um, Sebastian and Christian Bauhaus, his sons, were also the, the camera operators on it. They were his, they're his sons. Um, and we would go out on the weekends when we weren't shooting and just moor around the Mediterranean Sea. We had friend girls and inviting them on the ship with, you know, a crew of about 12 people. <laughs> um, totally amazing. Um, sometimes Prince had to leave uh, Nice and, and, and go somewhere else in Europe along with Steve and Bob and Joe Ruffalo. And guess who? Guess who was the captain now? <laughs> I had the boat. I had the boat. So I would invite broke folks over there. Um, Gilbert Davison was there with us. He was the uh, Prince's bodyguard. He would travel with Prince while he was around. Um, it was just an amazing, it was an amazing time to, to, to be over there with him and his creative. Major exposure. Wait a minute, what am I hearing, Drew? Is that me? The high fashion? Is that me? <laughs> that I'm not playing anything. Are you playing something there? Uh, no, man, I don't have none of that. <laughs> Oh my God, that's so funny! I kept hearing it, and I thought it was—I thought it was Terry. And I said, "I, said, okay. I heard that too. I heard some little squeaky voice up under there." Mm -hmm. It was high fashion, but I, yeah, yeah. where it came from. Yeah, that's already was right in line, though. Yeah, that is true. It's, it's definitely the soundtrack. Yeah, it's, you know, oh, that's good. It's the most definitely yeah. the right let soundtrack. It play. Whoever's so, playing it, let it so, play. So I, I got lost. What was the question again, Jam? Well, no, we were, we had just started talking about Cherry Moon, but you know what? Let's do this because that that was one of the questions on here. Let's go to some of the questions on the on the live here, real quick. I know we said we'd be an hour. We're, we're oh, don't a worry about bit it. over at this point. Are we good? Okay, so let's um, hold on. Let me see if I can see. Uh, Isri, Isri Fontes said, are you cool with Jesse now? Yeah, we're definitely cool with Jesse. Jesse's, Jesse's our brother. Been cool with him. Yeah. It will, we're never not cool with him. Yeah. Now it's just like your brother said, you always love him. You don't always like him. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sometimes you're going to have disagreements and with brothers, but you know, we can talk about Jesse. Nobody else can. Right. Yeah. He's just like Prince. We can talk about it. Nobody else can. That's right. So, that was our brother. So stop it. Yeah, yeah. we love Jesse. Yeah. Somebody said uh, talk about uh, Monty Moyer and Jelly Bean too. Um, it's interesting because uh, and and Jelly Bean and Monty were roommates. Yeah. On the road. That is how it how it turned out, and um, they were great. I I love the little. Uh, we should tell the story with Monty. The well, the one that I always think about because we were talking about the the uh, playing at the Roxy early on. But the one with the first time we heard get it up on the radio and we were driving down uh what was it sunset boulevard or whatever with all the ladies of the evening uh -huh. we're all out uh -huh. and we like pulled over to listen to the song and we're all grooving and stuff and then and then one of them was like who's a little white man in there yeah and look in the car <laughs> like who's a little white man in there oh money mo money mo and oh my was, god they they were reaching in trying to test the package sizes yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> that's right they said who y'all time we're the time what y'all saying said get it up and they said oh we hear that every night <laughs> 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 yeah we bet you do yeah, oh my god nasty thing I, 
don't stand close. I'm back running you over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Wait a minute. Somebody asked me what was the club. Where was the uh, thing? Debbie Joe, what was the club in St. Paul off McKnight Road? Was that Studio 94? Studio 94. Or no, Studio 50. No, Studio 94. 94. Studio mm -hmm. 94. Yeah, I used to DJ. I was one of the clubs I used to DJ yep. at back in the day. That is so funny. Okay, that, wait, wait. I that was it. part of the template of make me who I am and, and love for music as well. Soul Product says, I remember Jesse Johnson saying in one interview that after some time shows, you guys would actually invite troublemakers backstage to fight. I don't remember that. Why would we do that? Me either. I do remember what we would do is when we got into a town, you know, we'd always ask, you know, the people at the hotel or the groupies or whoever, we'd always go, you know, where should we go? And they'd go, well, you should check out the something, something, you should go to this club. But whatever you do, don't go to this club or whatever, right? Right. right. And that's the club we'd always go to. We'd always go to the club where they tell us not to go. Yeah. That was first that place was we always go. our thing. Yeah. And we Somebody. hit the mall in every city. Like that was the we always had to hit the mall. That's why yeah, I remember Somebody. the first I remember the first city we played was uh Pittsburgh. And I remember we were walking around Pittsburgh, downtown Pittsburgh, and I guess it was kind of rough part of town or whatever. And People were stopping us going, we had our trench coats on and everything because it was cold. It was like November, right? And, and, and they were like, wait, ain't y'all the time? And we're like, yeah. And they said, where's y'all bodyguard? And we said, bodyguard? We don't need a bodyguard. They said, wait a minute, y'all the time? Y'all walking around downtown Pittsburgh without a bodyguard? And we said, yeah. And people were like, oh, man, they, they serious, man. Oh, don't, don't mess with them. Like, we got, we got, like, the reputation, like, don't mess with the time. It's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? We were like, we weren't even thinking of it like that. But people uh -huh. thought we were crazy. Man. We were innocent. But somebody might have got a thrash, you know, if they. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we didn't let nothing go. Yeah, nothing was going down. Back then. None, <laughs> no, no, no. None was, none was going down. Uh, somebody liked our hats. These are the Jam and Lewis hats. Yeah, These will be available soon. I got mine. Definitely, yes, you do. Definitely by the holidays, we'll have them available for the, for your holiday yep. shopping needs. They should order the mask too. Yeah, we got masks too. We got a few different versions of the mask. Do I have one with me? I don't have one with me. I can't believe that. We have all kind of merch uh, coming, but yeah, we definitely have masks, and you know. I, and, I, and from what the way it looks, we're going to be needing masks. So, yes, yes. <laughs> so when you order a baseball cap, make sure you order. Yes, the man, you thought you were out. Exactly. Back yeah, right. back. yeah, exactly. Hey, you guys, just um, common sense, eliminate yeah. the politics. Common sense, you don't want to get sick, do it, man. Get sick, <laughs> right? Well, I want to oh, thank my you. lovely wife for creating all these things, oh, yes. yes. and things, and things like that. There. His lovely yes. wife did that, y'all. Our, so our merchandise, our merchandise manager, our Thank queen you, of Dara. merchandise. Thank you, Dara. The queen Dara. of the merchandise. I got all kind of merchandise. Wait a minute. What else do I have? I was queen of the merchandise. Right. Hey, by the way, um, uh, John Wesley Payne said, "Whatever happened to? Did John McClain sign you to a deal on A and M, Jerome? He did. He did." I don't know whether I knew that or not. He, um, think, nothing ever happened with that, though, right? He, he, um, what happened is, um, I was still working for Prince when I started, um, doing a lot of the, uh, the videos and stuff for Herb Alpers and Janet. And, and John was behind a lot of that stuff. Uh, yes. Um, they brought me in to do those things, and I still was working for Prince. Um, it didn't hit Prince the right way. He felt that, um, I was giving away uh, the components of what his organization was, but they were my components. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. That sounds familiar. And um, and he uh, he watched us do control video. We were shooting control video up in Midtown, uh, Los Angeles, and we're sitting in the Cadillac and everything. And I seen this this limo down the street. And I didn't say anything, but I, I seen it. 
Um, next thing I know, I get a call from uh, his people, and they say, ah, Jerome, ah, ah, you, you, you're working with Janet and Terry and, and uh, uh, Chris, and I got to let you go. I said, oh, oh, really? You say, can't y'all work it out? I, I, I don't want to do this, but can y'all work it out? I said, yeah, we can work it out. He said, but he he got he got to let you go. He said you'll be on uh payroll for three months and you'll have health insurance for three months. Yeah. I said, okay, whatever. Uh, you know, but but my brother John John McClain was there. He provided me with a lot of work. Yeah, um, I got a chance to continue to work with my brother. Um, somewhere along the way, um, I think Prince forgot that. Terry was my <laughs> my real brother, and nothing's gonna come between that ever at yeah. any time. Yeah. And um, uh, John, uh, he he took me under his wing. Uh, he gave me a record deal. Yeah. Um, I was supposed to work with another artist, and we went into the studio, and and things started just kind of falling apart there. I mm -hmm. continue to do video. I did a Ron Lively video. Mm -hmm. um, I did a, uh, uh, I did Herb Alpert, two Herb Alpert videos, Janet video. I did the uh, award show performance with her. Yes, yep. Um, uh, there was a lot of stuff that was going on and a couple of other things that he had me um, uh, do that I was compensated for. Yeah. So, you know, the loss of salary from Prince, I gained uh, twofold working with John McClain and, and Terry and Jimmy. And John, John is top of his favorite people. Yeah. Ever. That, good man. Good man. Yeah, he, he, he's a, he's great a great man. man. He ta he's talented beyond belief. And in his belief in Terry and myself, I mean, literally from the first time we met, he was always supportive of us. And actually, when we we met John, when we uh, well, Leon Silvers the third, who also we met at a celebrity basketball game, actually, and put us in the studio. And John was there that day. We played our first little demo tape uh, for Leon, and uh, he was all in. And, and he was the one. I mean, he's the reason we're working with Janet. Mm -hmm. You know, that was totally John McClain. He was the one yes. who made that happen. And this dude, that dude, loved. He loved these guys and. He loved music, and he loved the business of it. Yeah, <laughs> he yeah. Oh no, he did. But he was he was passionate about it. I remember when we did when yeah. we did the Control album. I'll never forget. He came up to listen to it, and he was the one that, of course, said, "I need one more song," and ended up taking "What Have You Done for Me Lately," which was supposed to be for our album. Um, but he was right about that. And when that record happened big, he told everybody in the company, um, like when he heard the album. We thought, yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a good album and whatever. But he was like, no, you don't understand. This album is, this is, this is double platinum, at least a double platinum album. And we were like, okay. And we had never had a double platinum album at that point. So we had had gold records at that point. And he told everybody, convinced everybody at the company, you got to think about it like it's a platinum album, a double platinum album. And I'll never forget when we went to the double platinum party and we were all standing on stage and A&M and getting our double platinum records I, I i couldn't be more happy for john that he was right but not only was he right about predicting it but he was right in executing yeah. what it took to get it there and i think we, you know we eventually sold like six or seven million of, of that record so yeah i mean john is is great and, and and things that people don't know like john played guitar he played uh part of the because the guitar solo on black cat one of the parts on that uh, John played that, you know, like Jesse, I think, played a bit, bit of it. And um, it was Jelly Bean, actually. Jelly Bean, Jelly Bean. Yep. But McLean played some that slide guitar thing on there. Yeah. He just kept saying, I hear I hear a slide guitar. And he just went in and did it. I was like, OK, <laughs> cool. Well, you know, he's one of those brothers, man, that's always giving and, you know, never wanting credit for it. Yes. He's not that guy. So you got to love that about it, man. I love it. So, by the way, while I'm showing merchandise, 
Mm. Can't forget about the. <laughs> yeah. The the bobbleheads. And then for you more romantic, romantical people, you have to have the. You have to have the Jam and Lewis candle. Authentic candle. This smells beautiful. Comes out, comes out like that. And it's a beautiful thing. And we love that. So anyway. Thank you, Indira. That's just a couple of couple of little items. There's more to come, but definitely in time for the holidays is for this holiday season. Now wait, did we lose Jerome? I think he's gone. I was about to ask you. Oh, yeah, I think we lost him. Okay, well, we'll see if he pops back in. Uh, uh, via in champ says, is there a time reunion coming? A Purple Family Tour would be awesome. The time, the family, Sheila E., Apollonia Sinks, Jill Jones, Jesse Johnson, the New Power Generation, the Revolution, Andre Simone, make it happen. True fans need that. Okay. Well, that, would be, uh, that would be extraordinary. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We will see. It is the 40th anniversary of the first Time album we're celebrating this year, which is um, cool. Um, let me see what else we have. We have some, have some other couple other questions we'll we'll grab. And if we don't get if we don't get Jerome back, you guys, what we'll do is next week maybe we'll continue with him because we we didn't even get anywhere really with him. We reminisce so much about growing up that we never really got into um, you know the career and the films and the records and all that kind of stuff. But I actually I think this is cool because the stuff we talked about was stuff that I didn't even remember. And yeah. Uh, Probably, probably more interesting, actually. At least it was. Yeah. yeah, well, just yeah, digging up all the old trolling the dirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, digging up, digging up the digging dirt. Up. Um, because the beginning is um, the essence of everything. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Built on. Um, here's one. It says, uh, cool was the first song and video I saw from the time. This is from Keith Roberts, uh, 499 on Instagram. Uh, he asked, Do, when I play the synth bass lines while touring with the time, was I doubling Terry's bass lines or adding an extra layer, but at the same time, keeping out of Terry's way? But yeah, we were duplicating the bass lines on that. And on the record of Cool, it was just keyboard. And then, but when we did it live, you doubled the bass line, basically, to make it, as, as, as Prince always said to us, it needs to be bigger than the record. Yeah, it needs to be better, better than the record. record. Yeah, yeah it's better than the record. Jimmy Jam, what are you playing? I'm not playing anything, Prince. There's nothing to play there. Double what Monty's doing. It's got to be bigger than the record. Okay, cool. You know, so that was always a philosophy. Um, Jeff Horseman on Facebook says, "What school was the video for Cool filmed at?" That's an interesting question because it. I just saw the answer to it. Um, our friend Alan Freed from the Twin Cities actually put that on his Facebook today, if I'm not mistaken, um, the school that that was recorded at, but I can't remember the name of the school. But it wasn't, there was somebody said that it was uh, Central, Minneapolis Central, which it wasn't. Um, somebody mentioned uh, Bryant uh, Junior High, which it wasn't, but we went to school at Bryant Junior High on the South Side, both Prince and me. Uh, so it was neither one of those schools, but somebody may have it was a school in Northeast Minneapolis, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I saw it. I just elementary school, wasn't it? Yeah. I might have been I just can't remember that. what the name of the school. I literally just saw it though today. And I think I even commented on it, but Alan Freed had it in his in his Facebook because he remembers all that all that kind of trivial type stuff. But if you if you look in okay, so uh, Alan. Oh, Alan's on. Hey Alan. So Alan said Sheridan in Northeast Minneapolis. Right. There you go. Thank you, Alan. Yes. And I know where Sheridan kind of is. That was part of my my history is I was a school bus driver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> trying, yes. trying, to make, trying to make that money. But that's how you were able to drive the flight time bus so good. That's right. Wait. OK, so here's a question, because I don't know, because the flight time bus happened before I was with. I mean, I knew you, but before I was with flight time. How did you get the bus? How did it get red? Who painted it? Tell me the story about the flight time bus. And if anybody has pictures of the flight time bus, Alan Freed probably does. I'd love to see a picture of the, the flight time bus from back in the day. Yeah, I have one somewhere. 
Okay. Um, but the flight time bus was, well, we had flight time bus version one. Okay. And um, we bought that bus for probably a couple thousand dollars and took the seats out. Mm-hmm. And we had like somebody's friend just painted red. Okay. We did kind of a little logo on it, flight time logo. Mm-hmm. And that bus lasted probably a couple of years. Okay. Um, and broke down on us every time we had to go anywhere. Right. So my dream was to always get a bus brand called International Harvester. Yeah. So we finally got an International Harvester. Mm-hmm. Who they, they did mostly farm equipment, but they also did engines for, for um, school buses as well. Right. So we bought our second one. And it got a better paint job, and we built bunks in it, you know, yeah. out of wood. So we just made the damn thing so heavy. We probably was burning about a block a gallon. Um, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> we had bunks in there, uh, places to sit and chill. And we used that bus for many years, man. And uh, used to be parked all the time uh, down at Davis' house on um, Sheridan. Right. Right on Plymouth and Sheridan. And I got yeah. a picture of that I wish I could show right now. A uh, picture of what? But with us standing in front of the bus. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, very, if we don't, cool. if we, if you don't find, if we don't find it this week, we'll, we'll find it next week. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be better equipped next week. I'll just pull stuff next week, so okay. we'll have some. Yeah, some good we, we should, we should continue with this. This, this would be fun. Let me, let me do a couple more questions here. Uh, Instagram. Um, Ace Dig Ace Digi nine one seven on Instagram said, "What song did you enjoy playing the most live? Live? Oh man, my favorite song to play. Uh, the Stick was one of my favorite songs to play. I was gonna say the Stick. Whew. The Stick. That's I love that's- I love the Stick because." It, it was that was the only song that I played. I had this keyboard called a Moog um, Liberation. It was my first guitar that I had, the, my first real guitar, and I used to play the solo on that of the song. And it was like the only one that I used. And we only did it on the first tour. We didn't do we didn't do stick on the second tour. But yeah, I loved it. Plus, I loved it because it was the first song we played, and it was basically our sound check every night because we never got a sound check. So because it just started off with just the drums, the, you know, our sound guy would get the, right, it was just boom, 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 right? So he'd get the drums all tuned up. And by the time we got, you know, by the time we hit that a few times, and then Morris, I'll never forget, like Morris just with his back turned to the audience, single spotlight on him, and he's just combing his hair. And the hey, girls were like, Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, man. I love that. Plus, I just that record, man. It's just yeah. Well, get up, get it up was fun. I mean, cool was yep. fun. I mean, they all yep. were fun. Yep. And then, um, I, I I don't know why. I, I guess looking back on it, even even when we started playing like a little bit of the. Uh, hold, on, hold on, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, T. Like uh, songs like "Dance to the Beat" and songs like those. Those were really fun too. We're doing our little new wave stuff. Got you muted there now, Jim. Yeah, no, sorry. I was I was talking to Jerome. He said it kicked him out and won't let him back on. Oh, okay. But I don't I don't see him back. I don't see him coming back on here. Try it one more time, Rome, and then let me see if if I see you, I'll let you back in. Okay. Sorry. Okay. 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 Yeah, we'll give it. We'll give we'll give Rome one more time. Yeah, all of those were good. Um Paul Wren SF on Twitter. Were there times when members of the time would just look at each other during a show and say, damn, we're exceptionally good tonight. Or was that just every night? I don't think we ever said, damn, we were exceptionally good tonight. Yeah. You might say, damn, we kicked ass tonight. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you know, there were always those shows though, man, where it's, it's like the analogy for basketball, the game slows down, you know, and you can play within yourself and all those other things. The basket looks huge. Yeah, it's, yeah, it was like that for us, too. Like some nights where you could tell the tempos of things were just perfect. Yes. 
and you didn't feel like you were rushing. You didn't feel like you were dragging yep. it just, because and we play live. We don't play the click tracks and, and there's no Memorex. It's just yeah. live. Yep. Uh, especially back in that day, there was no Memorex. Right. So everything that got generated on stage got generated by what? Five musicians. Yes. Yep. And that was it. Yep. So um, immediately you knew when it was just going to be right. And some of the some of the gigs that felt like the worst gigs actually were the best sounding gigs. Yeah, I agree. Because then you feel like you're not entertaining people like you should, and so you focus more. Make sure your vocals on pitch. You're not getting ahead of yourself. You know, you ch just the, the pocket is just right. So, yeah. And it was always interesting because what we were hearing on stage never necessarily related to what the audience was hearing. So we had nights on stage where everything sounded perfect to us. And then when we would watch the tape of it back, because we would watch every night, we'd watch the tape back and it would sound terrible, you know, or if there'd be nights on stage, we couldn't even hear ourselves. But then when we would hear the playback of the tape, it would be like amazing. It would be like, wow, that was really good. But, oh, yeah. But, I, but I'll tell you, and we've said this before, but it, it pertains to this question. Playing on stage was actually, that was easy. That was much easier than playing in the situations we were playing with as, you know, the local band. Mm -hmm. where we were trying to having to play country western music and polka music and, and, you know, all of those things prepared us. So then when we're on stage and doing initially, we were only doing a 20 minute set the first time, first tour. We were right. Opening the 20 minute show. And then we went to 45 minutes as the middle act on the 1999 tour. That was easy because we were used to playing for four hours, doing four sets of. Oh, five you know, sets sometimes. Yeah. depends. If you play the supper club, you had to play, you'd play a uh, standard set where you start yeah. playing uh, Misty and Blue yeah. Bossa Look and all that me. stuff. Yeah. You do all that stuff for the first set. Then you come out and you do a jazz fusion set. Yep. You know, more jazz, play some Miles Davis, whatever, yep. and you play, you play some things. And then, you know, uh, you get all the way down to the fusion stuff at the end or yep. you play stuff. Maybe you play some Santana in that. And yep. then you come out with your your uh, uh, R&B set and then some of your pop stuff. And then you end up with the up tempo. Kill them. Yep. The hits, the hits, the hits. Yeah, the hits. That everybody wants to hear. Yeah. The, the disco. You turn in the disco but at that time, especially like during the 70s and 80s, disco. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, you had to play it all. Yeah. And if you were at a bar mitzvah or you were at a, a place with a bunch of po uh, po uh, Polish people, you need to play some polka. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you had to pull it out, man. Oh, yeah. You so have to me, by the time we got to performing on stage and playing our own music, like that was kind of simple. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but one yeah. thing you, you learned is how it was all related. Yes. You know, exactly. and we kind of slash put music in different little cubicles, but really music is music. Yeah. yeah. I say only three kinds of songs, good songs, bad songs and hits. Right. You know, we can dispute two of them, good and bad. We can dispute hits. We can't pretty much can't dispute that. That's it's, pretty much it's speak for themselves. They speak for themselves. Exactly. And like, and when we put that, you know, it was funny because we we actually, um, for those of you that follow our our Instagrams, which are Flight Time Jam and Flight Time Lewis, we actually, an official Jam and Lewis, which is our our joint site, but um, we actually put up the other day. Um, there was a nice uh, billboard ad that went up from BMG, who's our label partners, congratulating us on being at the top of the charts. And the thing that we said in our comments were that the being at the top of the charts part we don't really do that y'all who are in this room right now do that everybody just, yeah everybody makes a hit so we make a song and we hope it's a good song and we hope it we hope you like it and if you like it we hope you talk about it you tell people about it we hope you buy it we hope you you know tweet about it or or, or you know share it with your friends or whatever we hope the radio plays it we you know we hope that people stream it when all of that happens then it's a hit. But exactly. we didn't make that hit. We just made the song. You guys made it the hit. Exactly. So I'll, we will just say in person, thank you. Um, but we put that on our Instagram the other day. That, that when we talk about the top of the charts, the only reason we're at the top of the charts is because you guys have put us there. 
as our partner. You know, when so Terry and I are partners, but as not in us making the music and you appreciating the music, that's another partnership that we and that's a been a 40 year partnership. We're going on our next year. It'll be our 40th anniversary of flight time. And uh, two years from now, it'll be our 50th anniversary, Terry, that we've known each other. So it's just milestone after milestone. <laughs> when you get old, it's just keep up with all this stuff, man. I can't milestone after milestone. I'm the trivia man. You know me, man. Hey, you, you love it. You got that trivia, got man. The, the I'm trying to get it. What's next? 40, 40 years uh, since the first time album. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we're celebrating that. And I've seen that in the comments. Thank you for people that are reminding us of that, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, 30 years of perspective records. 30 years of Sounds of Blackness, 30 years of, of uh, Mint Condition, yeah, of Stokely. And when you got to sound like uh, uh, TQ Tony Queen. And when you mention uh, yeah. Nick Christian, <laughs> you, 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 got mention, about... <laughs> you got to mention it's yeah. Stokely Williams. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Like TQ. Yeah, yeah. When yeah, you talk about Stokely. And if you're going to talk about this, <laughs> you talk about that. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. that's Minneapolis right there, boy. Yeah, man. So yeah, it's 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 all it's all good, man. It's all it's all appreciated. I told somebody the other day, um, or somebody was commenting on Stokely's new song that they they love, which is called Woman. Mm -hmm. And I said, Yeah, so it's really a celebration of of women. Uh and I said we went from 30 years ago, Stokely was talking about pretty brown eyes. And now he's talking about pretty brown skin. You know, it's just like yeah. we've expanded the the palette, but it's all it's all very cool, you know. Yeah. It's all very and cool. you know, I, I love the connectivity, man. Just yeah, you know, for, for those of you that haven't seen the video, you gotta check it out. Video is oh, beautiful because yeah. it, it was shot in Ghana. Yeah. Uh he went back to the motherland and you know got right to the beauty. Um yes. video director uh, Rex shot it killed it it's beautiful Ghanaian. he's a Ghanaian, uh, yes award-winning award-winning award yeah yeah he, um and the, the artist kitty is in that video with uh stokely he's a feature on that song so y'all check it out it's a beautiful song man yeah Woman. much respect yeah much respect and but a beautiful way to um you know to me if you're going to celebrate music celebrate it with music you know and so we have the opportunity with um and i and i see in the comments some some people enjoying volume one which we, we really appreciate but that to me is the way we celebrate music we celebrate 30 years of perspective records as our label with you know sounds of blackness leading volume one first thing you hear is ann nesby's voice well, actually you hear my voice saying you're listening <laughs> too <laughs> well, but it's just like saying the blackness yes exactly <laughs> gotta have that sonic id but as soon as I say what I say, first voice you hear is Ann Nesby and the sounds of blackness come in. And that to me is the way that, you know, you should start it. And so to have done that, starting with Optimistic 30 years ago with them and, and obviously through to here and now making the connection of, as I said, you know, break my heart, pretty brown eyes back then and now woman now um, with Stokely, um, you know, we celebrate it with the music. Um, and uh, along that line, somebody asked, are we going to do a 10 year anniversary of um, the original seven album? Maybe yeah, I think so. I think I think so. We'll start tooling that back up because yeah. that album never really got off the ground. It kind of got shot in the foot <laughs> before right. it started to run. Yep. And, um, you know, uh, some really good stuff on there it was never, never quite got in sync. It got instinct though, but it <laughs> didn't right. get instinct. So we 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 want to put that back out again. I think. Yeah, I, I gotta, agree. Be a good one. Yeah, I think I think we'd love to do that too. Um, Just Kaya says, "Who are your favorite brass players? Player, player or player? Hmm. Brass. brass. Well, we just mentioned. Uh, we just mentioned." Uh, um, Miles Davis. So you know you can Got it you well. can start you can start there. Start there. That's I, I, I will say I grew up as far as not individuals, but I will say that I grew up with the Chicago horn section to me was amazing. And the uh Tower of Power horn section and Terry turned me on to Tower of Power. And they cool. they were amazing. 
Uh, and the other one is uh, the sea wind horns, because the sea wind mm -hmm. horns, if you think about them, when you talk about the sea wind horns, you got to talk about Jerry Hay and you got to talk about, right? So all the Michael Jackson records, all those great horn parts you hear on those records, that's the sea wind horns that are doing those. So we love that. Um, somebody else, I saw also asked Terry about your favorite bass players. Who's your favorite bass player? Man, I have so many, man. Okay, so if, if I had to start back in the beginning, I cut my teeth on cool from Cool in the Gang. Yes. And, you know, he was so deliberate with his parts, man, and it was so simple, but they were so effective, man. You can't, yeah. well, you, when you think about bass, you gotta think about funky stuff. Now, everybody can, you know, there's people that can play a lot of notes, but that doesn't necessarily make you a bass player. Right. Because, you know, you could get in Prince's band or you could rehearse with Prince. If you play too many notes, he would unplug you. Yeah. <laughs> like he right. just walk over, he walk over to the amp and turn you down. Right. Because he, you know, it's all about playing the part. And it's more important what you don't play than yeah. what you play. Play the spaces. You got to play the space. And um, some people just don't know that. But uh, I, I love Kenny Burke. Back in the day, the stair steps. And y'all always listen to the Mary J. Blige song, uh, Keep Rising to the Top. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's the sample that it's from. Yeah. Uh, um, boom, boom, yeah, that's mm -hmm. Kid Burke. I don't know that, and then you know, all with the stair steps, he did his stuff. Robert Wilson was one of my favorites, Bootsy was one of my favorites, Cordell Monsoon was one of my favorites. All them cats that played with you know, with P Funk, P -funk. man, them dudes are funky, that is all the way there. Um, see. Uh, or Larry Graham, of course. Yep. You know, Prince was one of my favorite bass players. Yeah. Sonny yeah. Thompson. Yeah. Big up to Sonny Thompson. Yes. Um, who's one of my favorite basses. Still to this day, man, that dude, I owe him so much you know, just in terms of just concept. Dude had so much concept. And he played several instruments and just made it look so easy. Yeah. So fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know I'm leaving a whole bunch of uh, people out, you know, uh, upright basses, Ron Carter. Um, there's so many people, man. God. Yeah. You know, I'm, my, my brain misses a whole bunch of beats, but charge it to my heart. I mean, my head, not my heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to say the right thing. I just don't, I want to step in the poop, but there's, there's so many great basses out there, man. Um, there was this guy, man, and I and I forget his name, but he was in a group a long time ago called Earthbound, and I don't ever know what happened to him. Mm. But they came to Minneapolis, and they basically ran us up off the damn stage because they had the singing group with them, and you know, get all the ladies at the club hollered, you know, your gig is lost. Right. <laughs> so they right. came in, but this dude was so dope, man. Uh, his concept was just crazy, man. I saw somebody in the uh, in the in the chat mention uh, Mark Adams from Slave, and I just yeah, talked I like to Mark. Um, yeah, and I just talked to Steve Arrington yesterday. That was as Steve Arrington was the guy. Man, Steve Arrington, man, the drummer was as a drummer was just amazing. Yes, but yes. the combination of those two together, I mean, right. they call it the engine room, right? Where's the the drummer and the bass player together? Right. That's by the way. That's why you love one of the reasons you love Prince's bass playing so much, because Prince's bass playing with Morris together. Oh yeah. That was the engine room of of the Time Records. We got Jerome Benton back, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Man, how long are we gonna do this, man? Like we we ain't. Gonna I know, man. We we, we, gotta, <laughs> we gotta wrap this up, man. We going on we going on two hours, man. But um. We, we, we will do this again. We do this for, for those of you that are new. I've noticed there's a lot of new people in, in the chat that's asking about it. We do this every Thursday at 6 o'clock West Coast time, 9 o'clock East Coast time. And uh, the show is called Just Listen with Jam and Lewis. And literally, it's listening to conversation. We'll listen to some music. We don't really have music today, but we'll listen to some music. Sometimes we'll play little clips of stuff. Um, but it's really kind of the way that you guys would like to see the show work. And I, and I see some of you guys in the chat are also saying that Jerome needs to come back. And I 
agree that he does need to come back because we've barely scratched the surface of where he's at and we have a lot more to to talk about and a lot of records that we didn't even get a chance to to talk about i do have a question for you from instagram from nutter butter sutter who said was it chart was it hard for jerome to learn the moves when he joined the band or was he a natural is that, that a natural Jerome? Jerome? Is that were you a natural Jerome? Jerome? You were a natural, right? I'm a natural. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you Jerome's a natural because I'm a natural. You know, he he just I'm, fit right in like a glove. That was that was easy. I'm, you know, I I was I was in a comfort a place of comfort with these guys, and um, and it 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 just gave me, they gave me the freedom. They, yeah. They said, here's here's the field do what you want to do in this field it was and fun then, because we always said and we always used to joke we, we always used to say we, we would always do old man dances yeah you know we'd always be like hit the tilt hit the four corners <laughs> the, you know like it, yeah you know <laughs> that was always that was always the thing and of course nowadays they really are old man dances because now we're old man. So, we, but we man. can still do those dances. That's the thing. We're not, you know, too far out of our, they, out of our they, way. They, and a, they look and a lot of now. stuff like, oh, they well, coming you know, back. You, but you remember the bird roam? Like how Prince used to tell Morris not to do it. Yeah. And we were, you know, we were hard headed, right? So we'd start doing it. So I remember Morris would do the bird. Like he, Prince would be like, "Don't do the bird. Don't do the bird." And we come out. And we'd hit it, but we'd hit it like real gentle, right? Like yeah. real big. And At then first. We'd hit it like, and then we'd go, yeah, grow it. <laughs> it turned into and, the pterodactyl. Yeah, the pterodactyl. Yeah. And, and <laughs> oh it, it, became, it became that phenomenon. Mm -hmm. it, even, even white folks in Alabama doing a bird. Yeah. yeah because yes. It's fun, man. Like the thing that I, that I, I kind of, lost man was just fun with music and i always tell that to artists like why are we taking ourselves so serious i mean we do a divine art and we have a service to that art and we have to serve with truth and fact and all those things and you can't prince used to always talk to me about that he would tell me well they're not speaking the truth in their music okay and, and back then i didn't really get what he meant but now i understand what he meant um because music is there to serve us to protect us, to keep us informed, but also to let us let some steam off. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, you you can't be so serious about like everything all the time. But then you, know, you can't perpetuate negativity all the time. Right. Because everything's not negative, you know. They right. say what 10% of life is things that happen to you and 90% of life is how you deal with it. Right. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Got to keep the music pure and let it be what it is, man. Tell the story like it is. Well, you can't have the funk without the fun. Right? That's right. right. <laughs> the, what was it? What would it be? Mm, it'd be the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. You got to have it to be the shit. That's Talk right. About you to, shh. <laughs> we, we were put. We were put in a great position to make to entertain people and make them happy mm -hmm. and smile. Yeah. And some of these folks that are popping up on the Instagrams and everything. I haven't seen this in all, almost 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And they still live in that moment that we shared with them. Yeah. And uh, that's that's great. I love it. I love, yeah, that's love what being it should part be. of that. That's, and, but that's really what music should be. That's why, you know, as Terry said, it's the divine art. It yeah. really is. As you think about, I always say it all the time, you know, if I give you a year, you could probably piece together what was happening in that year or that month or whatever. But if I play a song from a certain day, everything comes back yeah the smells of the room the temperature you know the feel of you know you might be barefoot on a beach you might be wherever it takes you right back to that place that's divine that's divine so i'm gonna I'm tell y'all put 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 jam and lewis put terry lewis and jimmy jam in your pandora or on your serious and 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 watch the journey it takes you through think about the time think about where you're at when each song comes on yeah. A lot of those, a lot of those songs, 
I was sitting in the studio uh, and listening to him and watching Alex walk through, watching Janet come through, you know, all that, or watching Terry and Jimmy just bang out the melodies and, and remixing and, and all those different recording machines that Jan were talking about, figuring those out, watching them break down, all of that, you know, Mr. Hodge, uh, Jelly Bean, Monty up in there, Popeye, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, just vibing, man. Yeah, vibing. Just, it was, you know, just you know, vibing. Uh, Edina, Nicklet, they were some amazing places. And if you can get a brick from one of those places, if it's not there, get one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was. It wasn't the places, man. It was the people in the places. Yeah, right. right. That, that right. was the that was the power, man. I'm just sitting here looking at you know bases that people keep throwing by, you know. And, and and um man i i love all the bases that that came through um that everybody's saying you know jacob starts i love all those bases but I, the bases that really affected me were the ones that played the bass and the, when i started when i started playing with sam and dave they told me to play the bass you didn't play you didn't pluck you didn't do none of that so they got me on the kick of holding down the one holding down the funk on low end, that's where you are. And there's so many like Jaco Pastores was one of those bases that you could play. He could play you under the table. But I always say, you know, there's a whole lot of bass players in the world, but I played on more hits than a lot of them. Just <laughs> Watch I yourself. Keeps it, I keeps it simple. Watch yourself, Terry. <laughs> I keeps it is, simple. Is you is you preaching? <laughs> yeah, because because that's what it is. And when when I say the bases that I like, they gave me the concept like. Yep. Because it's all about style and concept over anything else. I mean, the shape and form, yeah, fine. Style and concepts, everything. When when you hear, and, and I like to liken the bass, if I liken it to a singer, when you hear an Anita Baker song and you hear, hear the first note, you know who it is. Mm -hmm. If you hear an Aretha Franklin song and you hear the first note, you know who it is because mm -hmm. The style, there's a texture, there's a feel that comes with that. That's what captures me with with all instruments, really, but mm -hmm. especially the bass, because I like technicians that have a style. Cool had a style. Now, he might not have been all over the place playing 54 notes, but he's going to tear them five notes up. Yeah, <laughs> those five notes are going to be the bo, notes. Bo, 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 bo. We go right. play that to the ground. Yeah, you know, I was I, just right. I was I, just thinking. I was thinking uh, what Hollywood swinging. Boom, yeah. boom, 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 boom. He gonna play it in, right. in like yep. different orders, but yep. them five notes are gonna kill you. Yeah, I, that's what I love about bass player because. It keeps you in the groove, but it doesn't get in the way of possibility. And it allows everybody else to, to morph around it and become something else. And we grew up in an age where that's what we did. We played together. And I I, I, I do miss that a lot of times. Yeah. Because that that makes the, the gumbo a lot richer. Yes. Yeah, you know, I agree. I've, I've said it before. Um, I've been blessed to, to have the best seat in the house. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and, and, you know, when Terry talks about keeping it simple, I've sat, I've sat in the other room and listened to him practice for hours playing simple melodies and, and, Excuse and me, bass bro. players bless know, bless you, ba bass players know he got a pocket. Mm -hmm. Terry can play in that pocket. He oh, can yeah. play behind the groove. He can play up on it. He can sex it and he, he can get it done. Yeah, and um, again, part. I'm just I'm proud to be part of Jimmy Jam. Don't don't, don't put them black and whites in front of me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it just in, in in addition to that, one of my favorite bases is Jimmy Jam actually because yeah, he plays the bass man. He play yeah. he be on some other stuff. I'd be like, okay, Ooh. just Ooh. let it go. Let me let me just get up under that and, and just hug it a little bit, a little and boogaloo up under there a little bit. You know, he make you he make you make that ugly face that Prince used to talk about. Mm -hmm. Look, everybody in the place just got ugly faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. And Jimmy you know, Jam used to do that when he DJed as well. 
He yeah. played along with the songs, and then that was amazing. Yeah, it, it was the, the the musical education that we had, just our, the environment we grew up in and, and all of the opportunities we had. And as we said at the very beginning of this two hours ago, we talked about the foundation of in school, you got handed an instrument. Like, it wasn't like, I want to do music. It was like, oh, no, you're going to learn the recorder. If nothing else, you're going to learn how to play that that little instrument. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, we had that opportunity. By the way, I'll say with playing the bass, anybody want to hear like my, some of my favorite bass work, and somebody asked this earlier, was um, on, uh, actually, when you dropped off Jerome, somebody had asked uh, about on the song Cool, when uh, when the song was recorded, it was just a keyboard bass. But when we played it live, Terry doubled, you know, my, my keyboard bass on it. And, but that became one of Terry and myself's, like one of our signature things was me playing the keyboard and him playing the bass over the top of it and us playing together. But mm -hmm. um, the song that to me is one of my, I mean, there's a bunch of them, but one of my favorites is Encore, Cheryl Lynn. Mm. It's pretty nice. That's, that's, you know, me on the OB-8 bass on the keyboard bass and Terry on the bass, on the, you know, on the Fender jazz bass. That's some yeah. bass going on. <laughs> yeah. And that, I mean, that that song is amazing. Uh, there's a song on the first Alexander O'Neill album called uh, You Were Meant to Be My Lady, Not My Girl. That's another one that's that's ridiculous. Um, you know, there's a bunch of examples of that. But I always one love of the ones with, that got us fired. Uh, uh, oh, Can uh, You Treat Me Like She Does? Yeah, Can You? Yeah. I Real heard that. Real? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody put <laughs> that record up the other day. I saw that on Instagram. Yeah, that ain't the real bass part, but that <laughs> yeah, right. That's an imposter, but the yeah. real bass part on that is like woo. Yes, yeah. and uh, and uh, for your love, SOS band. Oh yeah, for your love. that one's a good one too. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's been a lot where we <laughs> we get together and we play like that, and, and it's kind of cool. Um, Fishnet. Oh yeah. Woo me. Yeah. Woo me. Yeah. That's, that's a good one. Woo so, yeah, we, we definitely have fun. But it's the foundation. The bass is the foundation. And then uh, upon that, once that bass is solid and your beat is solid, then you can build anything on top of that and be and be cool. So that's kind of the philosophy that we've we've always had. So, um, yes. Well, that's that's a good way to end it. Yes, that is a good that, that is a good way to end it. You're so, only as tall as the shoulders you stand on. <clears throat> So make yep. sure your shoulders stand tall so people can stand on top of you. There you Ain't go. that the truth? You Ain't need that to lift them up. Got to do it. So everybody, we're on <clears throat> uh, Jam and Lewis. We are both on Instagram. I'm Flight Time Jam, F-L-Y-T-E-T-Y-N-E -E Jam. Terry Lewis is F-L-Y-T-E-T-Y-N-E -E Lewis. And that's both on Twitter and Instagram. Jam and Lewis on, uh, official Jam and Lewis on Instagram. I believe we're Jam and Lewis on Twitter um, and wherever else you find us. Uh, Jerome, what's your Instagram handle? I am JeromeBitten.com. Okay. I am JeromeBitten.com. Okay. I am Jerome Bitten. So uh, please follow us. And <laughs> I am. <laughs> please Somebody. follow us and enjoy keep us up to date uh, we appreciate all the comments we, we're glad we got to some of the questions we probably didn't get to all of them but like I say we're going to do this every week so um, please and let people know that if they're I'll interested in joining please do yeah you got to come back yeah Jerome yeah back. you got to come back we, we, to be continued here yeah, we um, got to get more song with you at the same absolutely. time. You know what? That's a, that's a good idea. Let's let's try to make that happen. I, would you guys like that? Uh, you guys in the chat, let us know whether that's something you'd like to see. We'll, we'll yeah. take and, the reunion up even another another notch. Yeah, and and on volume two, I definitely will play more bass for people who've been been asking. So, you know, yeah. only only if the song deserves it or needs it will I even play. I won't. If Jam is playing something that's so crazy, why would I even mess that up? I want to touch that, but hey, right. I just do some songs just from the bass, so this it'll be cool. Exactly. Yeah, and for those asking, yes, Volume Two is in the works and underway. Um, so yeah, so it, it is. It is coming. Jerome, thank you so much, man. Thank you, thank this you, Jam. So thank you, Tari. Fun, man, this two hours is flown by from, so it was supposed to be one hour but the two hours they've flown by totally from the, from the best seat in the house i'm telling you i love you guys 
Hey, man, we love you too, man. Love you too, man. Love you too, man. And get your Jam Lewis shit. Get your Jam Lewis shit. We're gonna put. We're gonna put it up. Uh, you'll you'll see. Uh, there will be a, a, a site up here in the next week, hopefully, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, everybody gets taken care of with what. Then we have a whole lot of great stuff, but we're trying to make sure this is all our test, all of our test stuff, our beta stuff. We want to make sure we wear it for a while, make sure that it, it breaks itself in right and it's good. Yeah. We want to be premium mm -hmm. quality, um, just as we try to do with our music. That's what we want to do with our with our merchandise. So. Um, but I'm glad you guys are liking it. We appreciate that very much. And um, and once again, we'll shout out to Indira one more time, our merchandise manager that comes up with all this wonderful thing. And and, and a shout out on the logo, Paul Kelb up in Minnesota. This is oh yeah, Paul absolutely. Kelb, this Polish logo. Pixel. Paul Kelb, he's our PK. man. Polish Pixel, that's right. That's his company, Polish Pixel. He's an so, amazing dude. He's the man. Amazing. Yeah, he's the man from from way back in the day with us. Been been with us on the whole journey. So yes, we appreciate it. Anyway, um, yep, everybody's saying bring on Morris. Okay, so we'll hit Morris and we'll see if we can get him to come on next Thursday. Next Thursday, same time, everybody, 9 p.m. East, 6 p.m. West Coast, Thursday night. We will be here. We'll let you know who it's going to be. But don't be surprised if you see Jerome back and don't be surprised if you see Morris. It won't be a surprise. Anyway, appreciate the uh, everybody coming out. Appreciate the love for Volume 1. Please stream it. Tell people about it buy it um there are autographed um versions and you of the have record it. that are that'll be going back up i know the first batch sold out thank you for supporting that but there will be another batch go going up on a, a talk shop live any vinyl you'll be able to get uh, some of those signed actual signed jam and Lewis cds for those of you that like product it looks sort of like that there Ooh, do you guys have vinyl yet we have vinyl on the way. It takes a while to get vinyl, yes, as we're finding out. But we're working hard to have vinyl here, hopefully for the holidays. That's what we want to do, because we know people want to do that. Um, but we definitely have that. And then, as you can see, an actual CD. You don't see those very much. Oh, anymore. wow. That's There's cool. An actual, the actual CD, believe it or not. So we do have that and uh, working working on more and a lot of fun more, you know, a lot more music to come. Oh, and I got to mention, too, um, the current uh, Jam and Lewis single is Mariah Carey, uh, somewhat loved. And uh, we were about that far from the top 10 with that song. So thank everybody for your support in making that happen. Because as I said earlier, it's not a hit until y'all make it a hit. It's just a song right now. But you That's guys right. are we're that close to the top 10. So I think we're going to get there. And we're really happy about that. We appreciate the support for all of the years and everything that we're doing. So Jam and Lewis Volume 1, Mariah Carey, there you go, breaking my heart. And that's it, y'all. We'll see you next week. We love you. Thanks. Respect. Everybody be safe.